But communication seems to have been a massive issue. The almost immediate and total collapse of communication networks has left us for days in the dark and more importantly, many communities completely and utterly isolated both phys physically and technologically. Um, and in the midst of all this, we've got a government that does its best. We've got a brand new Prime Minister who, I'm just going to be honest, seems to be doing the best he can at a tough time. Uh, what does this mean? And I, I was interested to read our mate, friend of the platform, Bomber Bradbury, write a piece about telcos and their responsibility to have provided better infrastructure. And Bomber, Bomber joins us now. G'day, mate. How are you? Shorter comrade, good morning to you, Sean. Yeah. Hey, I know you've got parents that live kind of rurally, semi-rurally. Are they okay? Uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> my, my, my dear old parents are just such gamblers. Um, they, 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 they're up north in their camper van and kind of got, got caught up there as the hurricane was, uh, as Gabriel, Cyclone Gabriel was coming in. So they've just kind of uh, pulled up and, 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 and stayed somewhere safe. Uh, their farm down in Waikato is as is, is, is fine as we know. All right, that's good to hear. Well, Martin, one of these things, and you've written about it, I don't know if we've got it up on the platform yet, but you've written about it in, in, in the Daily Bog. Um, boy, our mobile phone networks and stuff just, just folded, didn't they? Well, the problem was that everything was built on a very, very, very cheap network that was directly connected to the electricity, and they only have backup battery power for four to eight hours and because there was no heavy regulation to enforce them to build that resilience in they just didn't and i think the real problem is when you look at these telcos each of them are enormous enormous companies uh, uh spark i think their turnover last year was three and a half billion vodafone's was two billion and i think uh, uh two degrees and orcon combined are valued at 1.7 billion so these, these are companies who have large amounts of money because it was a very weak uh regulatory framework they were weak uh, working in they didn't build any resilience in. Everything's been knocked out. That's been causing even as much, I think, uh, fear and anxiety, the inability to contact people. Interestingly enough, none of the radio towers were knocked out. Radio was working the whole time. Yeah. Um, Martin, uh, uh, you know, does any company have to provide a public service infrastructure? They're commercial companies. Oh, they absolutely, look, they absolutely are. But I think that in this age of interconnectivity, where that network is almost as important as the roading itself, they do have an, a, a social obligation. Well, why don't, obligation. doesn't the government run the network if it's such a vital mm. public good, Martin? Well, I think... Why that, don't think, we nationalise our telecoms? Well, look, now you're just getting me excited, Sean. Uh, look, I'd... I'd love to do that as well, comrade. Let's storm the barricades of capitalism together. However, I think within the kind of range that we've got, there is a, a civil defence network that is very focused on um, the radio uh, and, and, and certainly they can suggest to um, uh, media that they run uh, uh, the civil defence um, messages in times of emergency. Those, those powers exist. Uh, but I just think that these companies who make so much money and so much profit out of New Zealand have an obligation or responsibility, very much like the banking systems. Look how, how, how difficult it is to get cash in and out of there. They have obligations to build in resilience as well. Well, they've also said, though, they've extended or made credit available. They're not giving the money away of people no, on no, mortgages. No, no, they have, they have extended, they've extended data to people down there, but if they're unable to get it in the first place, that doesn't really mean much, does it? Yeah, so you're saying any review, any look back at Gabriel must include, uh, may, you're suggesting legislation to demand a level of resilience amongst mobile or, or telco operators? Absolutely. I just think that what we've seen here, the extent of the damage and how quickly that network, which is such an incredibly important connection and connector, uh, that the ease with which that was knocked out, that there has to be, for the amount of uh, uh, public good that those companies provide, they've, they've also got some obligations. How come the Labor Party hasn't picked this up in the last five years and done something about it, Bomber? Oh, Lord, why haven't they picked up half a billion different things and done nothing about it? I think because the fundamental problem of the Jacinda Labor Party was that the focus was on the bureaucratic 
tables in the back rooms and you're shuffling those around rather than a constant focus on the end user, the delivery. And they've got so hung up on ideology over delivery. I mean, that's the whole idea of Chippy's bread and butter politics. It's coming back to delivery over ideology. And, and, and he's, I think to date, has shown a remarkable competency. Oh, yeah, but look at his government. Look at Stuart Nash saying, now's not the time to be a criminal. You wait till things calm down and then you can go and be a gang member again. Uh, Nash well, has also said blocking percent. roads it's, it's, to protect it's, it's, communities is illegal. A government that wouldn't come out with all the bullshit iwi road blocks and do anything about that during COVID, you know, and here are communities under real threat from criminal gangs. Uh, no way they're going to have the police or resources there. And we have our Minister of Police saying, no, don't protect your community. Well, I mean, that's, that's an interpretation of Stuart's uh, comments. Um, I, look, I, I, of course, any, any person who would rob from another out of some, uh, during a time of crisis, compounding the misery of a community is someone who we should rightfully condemn. But I would also hazard uh, a, 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 a defence here that you're seeing such complete collapse down there that people are being driven also by desperation and fear and that part of that is, is, is compounding problems. There are absolutely scumbags doing the worst thing imaginable but there's also an enormous amount of desperation. Oh really? Do you think the people are going around nicking generators that they're doing it to, to save their communities or something? Oh, oh God, of, of course, look, look, when, no. you, when, you are, when your back is against the wall, yeah. absolutely people are doing it for those reasons. All right, um, all right, I might, might suggest otherwise, but when we won't know. I'm not, look, and, and, and look, and I'm not defending that, I'm not defending yeah. that, but you understand the level of desperation, right? People, I mean, the, the, the catastrophe in parts of Hawke's Bay is just extraordinary. Napier looks like a bomb sitter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, I think that was... I, I watched One News last night and the pictures of that... Wasn't it power, staggering? ...power Wasn't substation where, where I, I, I knew it was bad. I'm being told it was bad, but to see it, you know, from the air and, and, and the close-ups, it, it's it's just massive. And, Martin, look, you, yeah. mean, you mentioned Chris Hipkins. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I don't have any politics, so I don't care. I think he has, in terms of being a figurehead in this time, done a good job. And everyone said, you know, that... Jacinda Ardern was the great communicator. I never bought that. But this guy is pretty good with saying, at saying what needs to be said, and it would seem to me resonating with middle New Zealand uh, in a very genuine way. He might be a better communicator than Ardern was. I was considering how uh, the coverage would have been different if Jacinda had been leader. And I think what we would have seen is an enormous full page of her hugging someone. And it would have been a lot of story about her connection to the person and, and et cetera, et cetera. Whereas I think that what you're seeing with Chippy is someone who is incredibly competent. This is an MP for 14 years. He's been in, uh, a, a cabinet minister for five. He's been leader of the House for five years. He is someone who knows what New Zealand is looking for. And I, I think what helped him enormously was the terrible performance by Mayor Wayne Brown on the Auckland oh, God, anniversary Oh, God, can you build a bridge? Wayne Brown oh, no, doesn't no, 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 cause no, bad I, weather. I, 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 no, 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 so, 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 so the, the, the point I'm making is that, that, that Mayor Wayne Brown's performance in those interviews was so woeful. Yeah. Chippy looked incredibly competent by Yeah, comparison. but he also has a news media that has an inherent bias towards Labour and the left. Oh, no, 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 and look, and, 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 you know, other than ZB. Um, I mean, that's, that's certainly true. However, the, the actual performance itself, when, when they were standing there, the lights are going, Wayne, Wayne was, his performance was so woeful that yeah. Chippy has looked magnificent ever since. Yeah. And I think that we're looking for competence, again, that delivery over ideology. One of, one of John Key's secret successes was he was so intellectually laid back. He was so relaxed. He was so casual. New Zealanders like that. New Zealanders like that kind of, you know, laid back connection uh, with their leaders. And we're, we're not a, a, an aggressively uh, up ourselves culture. And people like that laid back competence. And I think that Chippy's got that in spades. And that's what's connecting with people. Yeah. 
Well, look, we were speculating just before really all of this hit, or as it was hitting, that it would be a smart thing for Labor on the departure of Jacinda Ardern to Chippy to say he needed a mandate, let's have an election. I, I think that calculation has changed because of this, uh, because I think this is going to be bigger than Christchurch in terms of recovery and impact, and I think we've got a bad, lot of very, Absolutely. very bad news to come in terms of loss of life and, and stuff. Yes, yes. And, yes, and I yes. think it would be... Now is not the time to have an election. Oh, I, I just think it would be an abdication of responsibility. You know, you are in charge. Your position and your responsibility is to lead, to suddenly go to the electorate and say, hey, guys, this is really tough. We're going to we're going to tap out, and you tell us what to do. Next. I don't, I think that's inappropriate. Yeah. I think for for a disaster this large, response and and all of state response is going to be required for some period of time, and 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 that takes leadership. That take, and it obligates these buggers are, are voted in, and this is the moment when they're supposed to step up. Yeah. to just turn away and go, oh, let's have an election. I just think we'd be walking yeah. away from the responsibility, and voters would punish it. Yeah, right. yeah, okay. Um, look, I just want to share some texts coming through, Martin. Yeah, now nah, the people who ram raided and cleared out the Napier Kathmandu store in the early hours of 15 February weren't desperate. They're just low life criminal scumbags with no morals. Oh, look, a, 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 <laughs> again, comrades, I'm not defending any illegality in this terrible moment. But let's not pretend that desperation isn't going to be driving some of that. Sure, some of it's going to be absolute crime and these scumbags go to town, throw the book at them. But, you know, people who might be stealing for food, those sorts of things. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm, yeah. I, I don't think I've got the moral. Yeah, right I think they're more interested in. Uh, I think that. they're more interested in flat screen televisions, to be honest, uh, uh, and generators. Sure, sure. Honest, sure. And, and I've got no time for those buggers. I've okay. got no time for those buggers. All, all right. So, so we say this probably lessens the chance of, of a snap election because, I, as I said, I still Absolutely. don't. I still don't think that we know. Uh, the impact. Uh, look, I think another interesting narrative or strand to this that appears over the weekend, and they were trending on the top of the Twitter for most of the weekend, which I, for once, was taking a passing interest in the weekend for other other reasons. Um, but those in the media, particularly the Auckland-centric media, where the biggest media market is, and particularly NZ Me, New Zealand uh, Media Enterprise, or whatever yeah. it's called, and particularly uh, News Talk ZB. Yeah. Uh, um, that they were, and particularly Kate Hawk, uh, Mike, what's his name, Mike, Mike, Mike Hoskins, and his wife Kate Hawksby, um, yeah. that they had been downplaying, and so, and because it wasn't yeah. going to affect Auckland, they thought it was an overhype. I thought it was. Yeah. And look, and, I, and I'm not going to kick them or anything, but I think it's an interesting indication of how mainstream media has become focused on its commercial markets, and maybe has has lost sight. And it's a bit like the telcos, I, I, I guess, uh, Bomber. Lost sight of the fact that radio is a very robust communication tool and maybe they had a wider responsibility as well to provide not opinion on the weather but information on the weather. You're absolutely right. There is a, an eviscerating uh, uh, review by, uh, uh, by, by Media Watch on RNZ of ZB's coverage uh, of the cyclone. And the point that they make is that because telecommunications went out so quickly, for some, the only connection they had was radio. And they were listening to ZB, and what they're hearing is not what's actually happening the enormity of it wasn't sinking through. And so you're right. In that situation, they had an obligation to actually be far more uh, careful in their language. And, and the problem that I've got with ZB's um, opinion on that, and of course they're allowed to have their opinion, that's not the issue, but it was already well established before the cyclone hit us that it was going to hit nine, or had hit, had hit, 960 hectopascals as a as a as a, as a yeah, way, and as I a can remember talking to Philip Duncan from Weatherwatch last week, and geez, he, he gave us some great information, and he said, "Look, right. Sean, the science tells us this is going to be the lowest low recorded in New Zealand, and there's just right. scientifically no way you can say that isn't going to have a massive impact." And I really sat Bingo. up and listened to him. Yeah, 
Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if you were looking at the cyclone that hit the Wahine, I mean, that was, I think that was 980 something hectopascal. So, so this was something that was way worse than we had seen in recent times in terms of, 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 of pressure. So the scientific consensus on how damaging this would be if it hit anything has already established, and it seems that they'd be, weren't e- it, it, they either weren't aware of that, didn't understand the science, or they were just going for some cheap headlines. Yeah. Um, and look, in any case, the other thing, Bomber, I wanted to cover off was of course, a whole lot of people in the Greens, oh, this is climate change. This is why we've got to do this and do that. Um, I don't know. No one can draw me a line, a direct line of causality on this and whether or not climate change is man-made is another uh, argument entirely. But what we do know is that forestry, forestry that hasn't cleared its slash, um, and particularly people have been saying to me, bridges. Bridges are built to withstand floodwaters, but not huge amounts of, of wood coming down and hitting them. That's what's taken out so many bridges. Um, a lot of those forests, or, or I presumed, and this is a complete reckon, are there or are kept there because they're in carbon credit. Um, and I wonder if we haven't, in seeking to solve a problem, exacerbated its effects. Uh, I think on top of the telecommunications facing regulation, the forestry industry who make billions, who make so much money and who had so much political power, they were able to gain heavier trucks on the roads, which in turn have damaged our roads, Mm. uh, so they can throw cheap bloody logs off to China for processing. Um, I think that they have to be regulated as well. This damage that they have caused these... Yeah, these but a lot, lot of the non-clearance of slash is also a result of pressure from environmentalists. Um, it's not, no, no. Well, well, I think if you look at those environmentalists, they were arguing not just for pine, they were arguing for indigenous uh, trees as well so that you've got um, a, a good mix. So there has been abuse of the system, I think, in just going with pine. There are real problems here. Those communities have been terribly damaged by this. And I think it's going to be part of the review. Let's, 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 let's I think, agree on a truce, however. I certainly believe that climate change is real and is happening and is an existential threat to our species. You may not. You may not. But what we can agree on, and, 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 and we can argue about mitigation, right? And you can rightfully point out we produce an enormously tiny amount of bloody gas compared to India, China, America, et cetera, et cetera. It's ridiculous to try and mitigate. That could be an argument that we can have, right? But surely, I think, as New Zealanders, we can look at the frailty of our infrastructure yeah, I and look, the need uh, uh, to and that's the thing. That's and the, the need yeah. to adapt. Yeah, and that's right. the thing. And look, we already had, had no, I think we've had Grant Robertson saying the budget's going to change because of this. But to, maybe we've got to, to, you know, because we have had a culture of just enough is good enough, a piece, right. of, a piece right. of number eight wire. And, and yes. I look often when I go to somewhere like Queensland or far north Queensland, um, small populations, huge distances, you know, physical or geographical challenges, but hell, they've got infrastructure up the wazoo. And we have right. just fundamentally in this country, in all sorts of areas, not spent as much as we should. Time and time and time again. And I think that where we need to come together is on this adaptation issue. Because that, that, that Auckland anniversary flood... That was a once in 250 year event. Yeah. This cyclone, Gabriel, was a once in every 200 year event. Mm. We've already had in one year yeah. major yeah. events. And, and, and really, how, how you want to argue why mm. it's being generated, why it is, it's changing. Yeah. And hey, we here urgently is a, need. Yeah, here's another suggestion rather than yep. uh, that someone sent in, rather than mandate or, or, or regulate the telcos or other people to provide better infrastructure, you just tax them more and the government builds it itself. Oh, look, look, brothers and sisters, however, whatever, we need it done. Whatever, whatever the process of doing that, however that works, let's adopt it. I don't think we can be ideological on this, right? Yeah. I think we, need, we clearly need to... Uh, look, I mean, the damage to that... Re- I don't know mm. how it's going to... Re- you saw it. I don't know how that's going to be repaired. Is well, it repaired? you do. It takes time. I mean, if we were Japan, mate, they'd already have, have the, you know, the engineers <laughs> oh, out there please. building the new bridge. I mean... Uh, and I hope we do. It, I hope we do it, Bomber, faster, yeah. 
than the rebuild of bloody Christchurch, which took forever and still oh. really isn't finished. Look, you're absolutely right, and that is also a wake-up call for us. Maybe we need a Ministry of Works. Maybe we need to do this ourselves. Mm. I don't know what the answer is, but we've got to look at all possible solutions. Let's not forget that the forecasters are telling us, right, telling mm. us mm. there's a chance of another cyclone by April. So, okay. th- you know, these are, these are, these are, this is the way we're going to have to look at this now. Yeah. There are more extreme weather events. How do we adapt to it? Yeah, I, I hear you, Bomber. Hey, look, I, good having a chat, mate. And, and and look, it's funny. I don't think it's a time in some ways for party politics. And I certainly yep. think now the chance of a snappy from Chippy is much reduced. Thank you for your time, mate. We'll talk soon. That is uh, Martin Bomber Bradbury. He runs the um, Daily Blog website. And we publish a lot of his stuff on the platform, on the platform opinions page, and it's pretty good stuff. But uh, what do you think of his point that really the tel- telcos who provide all the telephone coverage, m- billion-dollar companies who've made pretty crappy little networks that seem to have folded like a, a pack of cards or a house of cards, I should say, as a result of this? Interesting.